Bonjour et bienvenue. Hello and welcome. Today's webinar of the chair and decarb uh, chair and decarbonization. We have um, Richard Adamson, and he will be presenting on industrial carbon capture in Canada's energy trilemma, an overview of the opportunities and challenges. We're going to let people um, trickle in. We've we're right on time, and usually there's a, a few minutes to as as the uh, participants kind of um, take their seats, uh, virtually speaking. Um, so maybe though in the in the meantime, I'll, I'll briefly introduce Richard, um, who is um, uh, he is uh, currently CEO of a company, uh, and he's based in Calgary. Uh, Industrial Climate Solutions, which is now a, a Baker Hughes company, and he'll be able to give us a bit more background on, on the company itself. Um, but he's been very active in this uh, space of industrial greenhouse gas solutions for over the past uh, three decades, both in Canada and the U.S., really focusing on the facilitation and commercialization, commercialization of innovative technologies in, the, in North America. And this includes serving as managing director of Carbon Management Canada, a federally funded network center of excellence, which support a lot of academic research in this area. Um, Richard, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to participate. And um, if uh, it's okay, we can um, I can pass you the uh, the virtual floor uh, and um, stop sharing on my screen and uh, turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, just one second. I'll see if I can make my technology. It's still saying I can't start sh screen sharing. So, yeah, it's just a moment. I have to, uh, to stop mine. Stop share is here. See here. if we can we have this. see if we can get the technology working here. Okay, so screen two, share. Is that working now? Yeah, looks great. Good. Okay. Yeah. Well, th uh, thank you very much, Mark. Um, so uh, first off, uh, the obligatory disclaimer, um, I'm not representing Industrial Climate Solutions or Baker Hughes right now. So any of my comments or blunders are my own. Uh, this is a, this is an area that's been really, as Mark indicated, has been really central to my interest in career for decades now. And, uh, and uh, we're go I'll I'll dive in uh, a, a few, and I, I won't go into a lot of detail on on what I'm currently doing, though that'll come up a little bit later um, on one of the slides. Um, the uh, I think one of the things that uh, I I need to sort of set the basic assumptions. I'm uh, more than a decade ago. I really stopped getting into discussions about whether climate change is real or any of that stuff. Um, you know, uh, I'm not I'm not interested in spending time on that. Um, I I come from a place that says yes, climate change is real. It's urgent. It's something absolutely crucial for us to get addressed, <clears throat> and we have to do it as quickly as we possibly can. Um, so uh, you know, that's that's the space I'm coming from. I'm not. Uh, uh, people have different opinions. Um, they're welcome to it. I just don't spend my time. Uh, debating that anymore. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I've just offended somebody, but that's just, oh well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by the trilemma and, uh, and, and, uh, and the objective of trying to get to net zero. And uh, net zero is an absolutely, uh, the, net zero is an absolutely huge objective. Uh, the net zero by 2050 is, uh, a an objective that IEA, the International Energy Agency, has laid out in their um, recent uh, reports, and I think uh, I I'll I'll lean heavily on them for the pathway forward. There's many different prospective pathways, um, but theirs is at, uh, about the most credi credible I've seen. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some of the range of, of different pathways as well and what my concerns are with them. Um, and then uh, we'll get into, won't spend a lot of time on the technology, but do a high level overview of carbon capture utilization and storage, uh, how we typically go about uh, capturing CO2 and what do we do with it once we've captured it. And, in, and I 
consciously separate carbon capture from the the rest of the problem because um, I've I've never liked CCS as a term uh, because the technologies associated with capture are totally different from the technologies associated with uh, conversion or storage. Uh, so it, it doesn't make sense to tie a pretty bow around CCS as a single concept. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the Canadian context and the recent developments uh, with the budget and such. And I really hope that I don't ramble on too much. Uh, I'd like to engage in a conversation at the end of it. So um, it's, it's important for us to get out of our, um, our framework that says the people I know down the street are, are, are representative of, of the world. Situations change, changes in global economics affect different parts of the world differently. Um, in particular, this, this indicates, this graph here indicates that uh, some of the impacts, uh, for example, the differences between the European Union and the United Kingdom, where energy infl inflation can be very high with very modest impact on food inflation, whereas in lower income countries, um, and lower energy inflation can be devastating on the food uh, on the food costs, and um, that goes across a lot of different parameters in terms of quality of life. Um, and so we have to, although I focus very heavily on the carbon capture side or on the climate side of things, uh, there's always the uh, trilemma that is we have to deal with uh, climate, we have to deal with the economy, and we have to deal with social impacts uh, at the same time. So it isn't so much trade-offs as finding the path, the optimum path that uh, uh, does the, the most good overall and the least uh, unintended damage. So the other part, part of the conversation is it's really easy for people to simplify the uh, conversation into um, this is what we need. We need to get to net zero and put all of the focus on what does the world look like in 2050. But you have to understand that we, we have to walk the entire path from where we are today to there. So how do we get from here to there? And so there's a whole narrative of the transitional process that requires transformation of essentially the global, not just the global industrial economy, but the entire global economy. Um, and 2050, some people, I, I, I heard a radio announcer this morning talk about 2050 is way out there. No, it's not. 2050 is right around the corner when you're trying to turn uh, something, change, transform something like the global, uh, global economy. So as an example, at the top of the chart here, you'll see you know, nearly 50% of electricity from low emission sources and down below, nearly 90% of electricity from, re from renewables. That sounds great, but the other part of that equation is we're going to double our reliance on electricity between now and then. So not only are we transforming, um, moving rapidly away from, uh, from uh, greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuel sources, to uh, renewables, but we're having to massively grow up the, uh, the electricity capacity. So I'm not gonna go through line by line uh, on, on this, but this gives a bit of a sense of how much has to happen in relatively short time. Five years is nothing. Uh, so these five-year increments are really short. So this is a tremendously fast transformation. The other thing that's really important is down in the bottom right corner, uh, green is often a good thing, but in this case, it is not. So this is by 2030, not 2050. In order to be on track to do this, we actually at currently don't know how we're gonna get enough batteries. We don't know how we're gonna get enough copper. We don't know how we're going to get enough uh, electrolyzers for hydrogen production. And we don't know how we're gonna get enough lithium. And that's in 10 years time. Uh, we don't have the projects announced. We don't know exactly what that path looks like. That's pretty scary. Um, so uh, from the carbon capture utilization and storage side, um, 
we basically, the plan is that we're going to be sequestering 6.2 gigatons, 6.2 billion tons of CO2 a year by 2050. We currently have about 11.9 million tons of capacity. That means we have to, on average, every year from now until 2050, start up 100 new plants of 2 million tons. And 2 million tons is about the largest plant that's ever been built uh, every year between now and 2050. And there's a few tens, less than 100 projects in the design phase right now. Um, and most of those won't actually make it to build out. So um, we're barely getting started right now. So we need 3,000 to 6,000 massive scale projects in operation by 2050, and we've got 30 now. So that's a huge hill to climb. And then we look at the uh, emission drive down per sector. Well, electricity is mm, in some ways relatively easy to transform, so it, it drops fast. But how does industry get a drop? Well, a big chunk of the industry drop is transformation to electricity. Transportation, well, a big chunk of the personal transportation is transformation to electricity. Buildings, well, we're moving to heat pumps and that sort of thing. So uh, most of that is transformation to electricity. So that electricity sector side is just, uh, that's a huge hill to climb. And um, although uh, the net zero involves some negative in emissions, uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and direct air capture with storage, it's a really pretty small slice to make up the shortfall at the, at the toe of the curve. So um, why I like the uh, IEA's net zero energy, first off, net zero energy is a really ambitious target, and I, I, uh, I am skeptical as to whether we'll make it all the way to net zero by 2050, but we need to try as hard as we can. I'm in the CCUS business. The closer you are to something, the harder it looks to get to. I like their plan because it calls for some of the least CCUS, and I still see major problems both in supply chain and the capacity of just regulatory authorities to approve that number of projects uh, that rapidly, uh, let alone uh, all of the other capacities required to build them out. So having CCUS play a smaller role in the project, in, in the overall process, I think is practical, but it's, and the other thing is a, a big chunk of the supply chain for CCUS, you see this huge bar over here on hydrogen, um, a lot of the industrial equipment, um, uh, large scale compressors and that sort of thing required for the hydrogen side is also in the supply chain for CCUS. So those two are gonna be competing with each other for uh, major industrial components. So um, we, need, we need a portfolio, we need to, we need to do, we need basically everything we can throw at this thing and, pro and more than we know about right now in order to get there. Um, if we're really serious about getting to net zero by 2050, we need to start 20 years ago. Um, so on the, on the carbon capture side, cement has a, uh, cement, iron and, iron and steel and chemicals all have a large role. Chemicals is particularly interesting in that, um, uh, they're very reliant and are expected to continue to be reliant on oil into the future, which means having to decarbonize certainly the upstream part of uh, oil, but also making sure that uh, you're decarbonizing emissions at the chemical plants themselves. So what's happening with oil, the fossil energy side uh, going forward? Well, it's, um, it's easy to say, we can we can drive out coal um so we drive out coal everywhere else except asia pacific um china and the and the greater asia pacific area has got uh, even though the coal drops dramatically it's such a huge component of their economy at the start 
there's you're just not going to get completely eliminate coal. That's a big, big deal. Um, on the other hand, natural gas plays a big role um, in, especially in the Middle East, but also in North America and Eurasia, and oil more so in the Middle East and North America. So those are, there's still, as hard as we try and drive those out of the economy, there's still a role to play in them. So as you can see here, uh, for example, the, the, what's the pathway to getting to iron and steel? There's hydrogen is a, a, a big piece, hydrogen and electricity are a big piece of it. Um, where there is fossil use, we need to put capture on it. Um, in the cement sector, again, more uh, innovation, solid, solid bioenergy uh, in there, various things, but we still have uh, carbon capture and storage. On the chemical side, there's a little bit of carbon capture and storage on, on the upstream side. There's still a lot of oil as feedstock, but there are, uh, much of that gets transformed into the product. There's still some emissions associated with it you need to capture on. So um, chemicals is going to be a, a, a persistent uh, challenge to address in the transition away from fossil, um, the fossil sector. This is the other challenge um, is where do you get the money to do this? This is a massive transformation, both in advanced economies and in uh, developing economies. And the, the amount of the largest amount of that is private. So in order to be able to get that private money invested, the, the business models have to be there that will be attractive to the investment community. So um, there's only so much that can be done with pro, uh, public money. Uh, the, the private money in the advanced economies and the private money in the uh, emerging markets still are absolutely huge. So um, policies and functioning markets are critical to make this work. We can't just strong arm our way through it. And by the way, this is, these, you know, this is like $3 trillion here. This is not small potatoes. Um, and that's by 2030. This is per year. So um, what are our limitations? Cost-effective transitions require well-functioning markets. That's what I just said. Um, almost every uh, transition technology faces supply chain limits. There is uncertainty. Uncertainty is the, is the enemy of that investment that we need. Um, so we, the political polarization is a major issue. Europe has, has done, uh, is yards ahead of us in terms of most of the uh, legitimate po political parties there are in agreement around the importance of uh, the climate file and they generally don't threaten to undo each other's policies. Um, there's of course lots of debate about what's the right policy, but um, it's all towards how do we solve the problem. Nobody's trying to undo each other's uh, other's policies. Uh, the uncertainty in North America is really toxic, and is is one of our biggest problems right now. Um, I won't go into this in a great deal, except this little orange dot up here. Uh, so the the transition. So you see the amount of investment in oil and gas has, is going down, but not massively. But this is the investment in clean energy that's required. And that little orange dot means that for every dollar that goes into oil and gas by 2030, we have to put $9 into, uh, into clean energy. So, there's still going to be oil and gas usage right out to 2050. In the net zero uh, economy, you have to, there's only one way that you can continue to use fossil energy or fossil sources in the economy. Um, and that's with CCUS. The vast majority of it, we need to stop 
as much wherever we possibly can um, uncontrolled combustion of fossil energy. That just doesn't make sense. But there are places where we need, uh, we don't really have much choices. So we need to find other ways to mitigate the emissions. The issue here is climate change. The issue here is emissions. Um, the means to get there is uh, we, we need to find the best means we can with the minimum negative impact. So what's carbon capture? I'm going to, I'm talking too long, so I'm going to go as quickly as I can here. Um, very simplified. This is the conventional, uh, what's called wet capture, uh, a solvent that is, that loves CO2 um, is, is put into contact with the flue gas and absorbs the CO2 out of the flue gas. Um, the so-called rich solvent um, then gets heated up and the CO2 gets driven off, uh, goes to compression. It actually has to go through a couple of other stages, drying and such, but basically that's the energy input side to drive the CO2 back out of the solvent, which then returns the solvent back to the absorption side. This bit of kit here that allows the gas and the liquid uh, to come into contact, the, what I call the wet front end, is about a third of the cost of a capture plant. It's the size of a small skyscraper. Um, and that's the technology I'm working on right now and have been for the last six years. We've got an absorber technology that basically reduces the size of that piece of kit by five to one, which is uh, pretty transformational. So it matters, it's easier, some sources are easier to deal with than others. Cement plants put out CO2 at 20%. So if you imagine you've got, a, you've got some water, you put one drop of ink into four drops of water, you've got to get the ink back out. That's, that's not unimaginable. Coal-fired power at 12%, you've got seven drops of water for a drop of ink. Uh, industrial boilers, like the kind they use in oil sands, that's harder, it's more expensive. Um, so you've got about 10 drops of water for a drop of ink. Natural gas is harder yet, double uh, half the concentration. So you got a milliliter of water with a drop of ink in it. Direct air capture is a killer. It's very, very hard. So you've got one drop of ink in a quarter cup of water. Now get that ink back out. Um, the people talk about how expensive carbon capture is. There were a bunch of plants planned that they never could figure out how to make the economics work. Then Boundary Dam was operational. They made a, they, let's say there were a lot of learning opportunities. There were a number of engineering issues that have been, have contributed to our knowledge about how to do things right. And they've been fixed, but it contributed to the cost. Um, there's a whole bunch of other projects that are on the way. Shand is another SAS power project that's proposed. So you can see uh, SAS power has gone from over $100 a ton down to below 50 uh, through the learnings at Boundary Camp. So there's, and then this next generation of, of technologies is driving still further down. So the cost of capture is getting better all the time. All right, so you catch the CO2, you need to find some place to put it. You can do utilization or you can do storage. Utilization, there's a whole range of things. Non-conversion, eh, that's really all you're doing is delaying the release. So you, that CO2 is only um, sort of hours to days to weeks out of the cycle and it's back in the atmosphere. Um, some of these have got longer scale, longer time frames, concrete, bauxite treatment, uh, those types of things. Uh, geological storage is where you've got you know, uh, very, very secure storage for 10,000 year plus timelines, long enough for things to essentially turn to rock. Um, so the dedicated geological storage is a great path forward. Don't have time now, but uh, enhanced oil recovery gets a bad rap. Uh, there's actually um, a lot of reasons why it should be uh, given a closer look, but it's it's an easy sound bite to, to say it's an awful thing. Um, ain't so awful. Uh, the uh, deep sequestration, it's really hard to convey what it, what it means to inject CO2. People say bury it. Well, bury it a kilometer and a half under the surface is not quite just burying it. it uh, if you know your geology and you've got it solid, um, you've got a very, very secure storage space. 
the other, the downside of this is it's a pure cost. And uh, my argument is you didn't just give up on trash collection until uh, we'd figured out how to do recycling and make a profit at it. Um, this is this is an existential threat. We have to deal with carbon management. Um, it needs to be a cost. It will be a cost. It has to be collected by the commons. It'll be a government government funded, government supported pathway forward. And um, oh well, that's the cost of living on planet Earth. Um, so a thing to pay attention to, I'm not gonna mess around with uh, all the details here, except this is a map of where the geological storage capacity is in the world. The dark red is the best stuff. And oh look, uh, the biggest chunk of really good carbon storage capacity happens to be in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. Um, so why is it? Uh, a good thing for Canada. First off, almost everything required to do this uh, is transferable from the oil and gas sector. So rather than just uh, shutting down the engineering capacities, uh, the geosciences, uh, the pipelines, drilling, seismic, and all the field services side, the environmental monitoring, and the policy and regulatory that's built on oil and gas uh, uh, in the background, um, and also chemicals production, because basically carbon capture plants are like a small chemical plant. Um, all of those things um, we have here. Uh, in the future, you won't build a chemical plant unless you're close to a storage site. Uh, we happen to have both the feedstock and the geological storage capacity here. Uh, it doesn't make sense to be shipping that stuff all around the world. It makes more, far more sense in a carbon constrained world to build your chemical plants someplace like Western Canada. Um, so uh, it, that is if we can get our policy and economic street. So the other thing is everybody's chasing the energy transition. Um, the US policies are very simple and straightforward. Here's the rules, this is what you do. It's in the, tar in the tax code. You have this amount of, uh, you, you get this amount of dollars per ton. Um, in a, that you can flow through to your investors. It's bankable. Go out and get your money and build your project. In Canada, we got a little bit of bankable stuff and then a whole bunch of stuff that says, well, if you apply to this program um, and, and jump through a whole bunch of hoops and put a huge amount of effort up front, you may or may not uh, return some funding um, or you may or may not get carbon credits against some future value that the, you know, the current government says will be this way, but the next government says it's not gonna be that way. Um, so you've got all of these uncertainties um, that make it less bankable and makes everybody wanna stand on the sidelines, the investors and the industry side. Um, same thing with the blue hydrogen. Um, it, it looks good on what it could be, um, but what it could be and what it's actually bankable is are two different things. So uh, the, the Canadian investment tax credits coming out of the, uh, of the current budget indicates very good support for direct air capture uh, and uh, CCUS for the first, for the next eight years, seven years. This is what's been proposed. Um, and then it diminishes after that. Um, but all of the details are still being under development and there's an awful lot of uh, discussion back and forth about what those details will look like. Um, the, there, there's a contract for dis differences arrangement. This is the concept at $170 ton, uh, ton threshold, which the government mooted last year, uh, but what that value, what the CFD value would be is, um, is still under discussion, but the idea being if the current dollar per ton cost, uh, so before you build your project, you're guaranteed a certain value per ton of CO2 sequestered. If the, if the market price is lower, the government makes up the difference. Or if the market price is higher, then you have to pay it back to the government. Um, so it, it mitigates risk. Um, 
there's a chunk of that that's in the Canada, Canada Growth Fund that's managed. Is, and again, it's one of these things you've got to jump through the, the hoops and maybe you get signed off and maybe you get approved and maybe you don't get approved. Um, now the federal government is saying they're going to develop a complementary system. So we've got yet another system that we have to deal with. Let's keep it as complicated as we possibly can. Um, so barriers, uneven political support, uh, paralyzing access to capital, non-bankable, uh, maybe, maybe not uh, types of, uh, of support. The higher the risk, the higher the uncertainty, the higher the returns the project has to make uh, on paper before it'll pencil, pencil out. Um, what's needed is stringent regulations that get tighter and tighter over time by a known formula that the industry can count on and the investors can count on so they know what their economics will work out to be. And it doesn't work if the next government gets in by saying, no, no, we're gonna undo what the last government did. So I'm I, sorry, I had to go pretty fast to try and keep that to a half hour. I'm more than happy to go back and restate or clarify any of that or wander off into other terrain, uh, some of which I may actually know something about. <laughs>